first question um, was really about the difference between ventilation and oxygenation. So for, for lifeguards or for anybody um, that's treating patients in a first rep responder type of situation, how would you get them to think about the differences between effectively ventilating someone and oxygenating someone, which are not exactly the same thing, right? No, right, that's correct. And I can imagine that sometimes this is very difficult to understand. But actually, if you if you consider it as a transport uh, truck and something it, which is in it, it's 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 easier to understand. So ventilation is is just the, the truck; it's moving. Something is moving from pl place A to place B. So you're moving, you're you're breathing in and out, which means that you're having air going from from inside outside the body inside inside the body. That's the ventilation. That's the movement of the air into the body the oxygenation is what it contains it's the oxygen that is going to move from outside inside there's only some some 20 percent of all the air consists of oxygen and it's this typical oxygen that is uh, relevant for uh, for the body um, and so the oxygen has to go from the from the air uh, into the lungs into the alveoli uh, and then via the blood into the cells and that's what the oxygenation does. So that's the transport of oxygen from the open air into the cells where it does it work. And, and I think the, the uh, position statement does a good job of uh, pointing out that before we even talk about oxygenation, we need to ensure there's an open airway and that there's effective uh, breathing, uh, effective ventilation. And only then can we begin to think that our oxygen will actually be getting to where we need it to go. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. That's the, that's the road the oxygen has to go. There, there needs to be a, a road from A to B, from outside to inside. And for that, you need an open airway. Um, what are your thoughts about when oxygen should be given? Um, do you have some clear and simple guidelines for when a lifeguard should get the oxygen and put it on um, versus not using the oxygen and just going with, let's say, um, assisting with ventilations? Yeah, oxygen is, is most of all needed, of course, when there's a lack of oxygen. And um, this is a very gradual system. You, you, you can just lack a little oxygen, which probably doesn't affect the body too much, and you can live with that until the situation, there's no oxygen at all. And the last situation is in the situation of resuscitation. And of course, in a resuscitation setting, most of all, it's important just to do the very basic things, ventilation, mouse-to-mouse -mouse ventilation, mouse-to-mask -mouse ventilation, um, and, uh, and, and to do that. Um, but the, um, and then do the, 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 the compressions with that. But as soon as this is working very well and you have oxygen available, adding oxygen to the resuscitation is always very helpful. Um, and there are many reasons to do that, and maybe we can talk about that more later. And then from that most severe situation, you're getting into a situation where somebody is really feeling uh, respiratory distress, so breathing very, uh, very quickly, uh, either because he had a non-fatal drowning, is taken out of the water and, and feels very uh, either exhausted because of all the efforts, but also because of the, 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 the damage in the lungs, because maybe some water has entered the lungs which makes the ventilation more difficult to do that in that typical situation also. And then you're getting in situations where you think maybe it, it might be good doing something like giving ex extra oxygen. One example, for example, is when somebody is, is uh, hypothermic and is shaking very much and is trembling because of the, um, the, the, the cold body temperature, um, the shaking of the body, uh, consumes a lot of oxygen and of course it will be beneficial at that stage to add a little bit of oxygen there also and uh, sometimes there are other situations but a lot of that depends on local legislation uh, if you're allowed to give oxygen or not to give oxygen the um, the more flexible one is in giving oxygen the more indications there are the more restrictions there are from a legal or a medical point of view to give oxygen the uh, the indications may may shift uh, to a, to a higher more difficult indication. Okay, so I mean I think we'd all be on the same page of saying if there's respiratory distress, unequivocally they'd get oxygen. If there's um, an arrest, 
or like an active resuscitation, clearly oxygen. Do you think there are times that oxygen doesn't need to be used where it is used, perhaps used too much or unnecessarily? For example, sometimes I see patients who might have oxygen masks on who are maybe anxious, um, but, but not, not having respiratory difficulty, not in distress, not after a resuscitation. Do you think there's any harm to giving oxygen unnecessarily or not really? Yeah, I think for a medical doctor, it's quite easy to understand the different situations, when and what not to do it. Because as I said before, it's a very gradual, uh, gradual field of indications where you're going to use it. You certainly shouldn't give oxygen when somebody is hyperventilating. I mean, that is a uh, situation where, where there is no place for oxygen at all. Um, and, and that's the same for being anxious. Um, at the same time, sometimes it may be reassuring to do that. Um, but again, here it's it's very much about what is what is strain. How how would a life got strained to do that? If they recognize that situation, I I wouldn't bother too much because in general there is very few really negative effects of uh, of oxygen um, in in that particular particular situation. But um, I agree with you that sometimes it's giving too too easy and it, it 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 is not necessary. But at the same time, apart from people who are hyperventilating, because then you have really a different situation by anxiety. Uh, so hyperventilation by anxiety shouldn't do it. In other situations, as far as I'm concerned, it can't do harm, but it wouldn't even be beneficial. But maybe you have other thoughts about that, and I'm happy to discuss that with you. Well, I'm, some of the studies that, that I've looked at talk about the dangers of hyperoxia, as we know, with uh, in MI, in stroke, and in chronic long-term use in intensive care units. So we know that the ones who got hyperoxia, too much oxygen, uh, for days will have lower uh, survival rates in ICU. But um, I think there's there's good studies now out that show that within that early period of kind of the period we're talking about, pre-hospitally, lifeguards, emergency department, the first uh, hours or day in ICU, we don't really need to worry about hyperoxia as a, a pathological um, event for our patients. Is that, is that about right? No, that's absolutely, uh, I absolutely agree with that. And that's also the reason why I didn't know, didn't mention this more academic clinical um, uh, discussion around the uh, the hyperoxygenation. Uh, we talk about the very acute phase of, of uh, on the beach or on the, on the pool deck uh, where there is an acute momentum that you have to act and um, you shouldn't um, um, be distracted by all kinds of theories about the bad effects of, uh, of oxygen maybe on the long term. Yeah. Now, do you have a practical bit of advice for lifeguards on ways of delivering oxygen? Like in your mind, how would you advise someone who has maybe never given oxygen before to think about or view nasal prongs versus face masks versus non-rebreathers versus bag valve masks? Do you have sort of a simple um, way of advising um, junior members of your team on that one? Um, absolutely. I think this this is a um, a very difficult question to answer. Um, from from my perspective, I think you only should deliver oxygen when you have followed an oxygen course, which um, has included one or several of these uh, these techniques. So it's not something that you just can learn from just reading something about it or just watching a video movie around around things like that. So. Um, in my country, in the Netherlands, this is really a, 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 a several hour course where you learn everything about the equipment, about the, the safety, because it has also some dangers there, uh, about the different uh, methods of administration oxygen and how much oxygen you give with each of the different um, the different techniques. So that, that would be my 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 first remark on 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 that one. When a junior lifeguard wants to give oxygen, he, sh he should know that from his or her uh, training program all already. Um, but um, once having had this course, um, the um, um, there, there is 
uh, again, here, there's this gradual difference in the way you provide oxygen, how much oxygen you give. So if you only give a nasal cannula and you give only two liters of, of oxygen per minute, that doesn't really increase the uh, oxygenation of the blood very, very much. While if you have a non-rebreathing mask, which is a mask with a bag under it and you breathe, so while you exhale, the bag fills with the oxygen coming from the bottle. So, and then you inhale the full 100% of oxygen from the bag hanging under the mask. Um, then you provide uh, almost 100% oxygen to to, uh, to the person. So there's there's the many the many different ways doing uh, doing this, and um, giving a mask a normal mask with oxygen while um, breathing spontaneous is somewhere in between these two options. So, oh sorry, so that's a little bit of an answer. No, no. Yeah, it's the same situation um, for, for us in New Zealand. Uh, we recommend the juniors to think about oxygen and to bring the equipment to the patient's side, but they obviously aren't going to be using it until they've had a specific oxygen therapy course. Um, now, what do you think about the use of pulse oximeters? And in general, I mean the fingertip probes um, in the lifeguard setting. Um, there are some good studies out there, including one uh, you did, that look at the wide variability in pulse oximeter readings um, by manufacturer, um, which also vary greatly depending on the temperature of the patient. So the fact that they're poorly perfused, especially the fingertips, um, clamped down, um, not getting much blood flow, they're could be real concerns that the numbers we get will be erroneous. Now in the hospital, we have the benefit of typically warm patients and fancier pulse oximeters, but on the beach, we don't have those. So what do you think about the role of, of pulse oximetry in the resuscitation uh, on the beach side? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And as you mentioned, I did a study maybe already 10 years ago when we kind of developed a, I don't know if you know the Paris-Dakar Paris race in Africa with for cars. So uh -huh. we kind of developed the Paris-Dakar for pulse oximeters to, to just to test them under the most severe circumstances. And actually, um, it's still a pity that that study had never been able to proceed. And, and I really, maybe some of the people in the audience would be getting motivated to repeat that one with uh, at, at this stage. Because what was coming out of that study was that there was a great variability of the uh, the work of the, the pulse oximeters. Some really did very well, uh, some did very bad. And I can imagine that, meanwhile, the technology behind it has improved very, very much. Um, so it, I, I still think that it could very well be possible um, to use them. Um, but on the other side, you're talking now at the very, very high end of, of professionalism of lifeguard work. If, if you if you have the, the finances to, to buy pulse oximeters and know how to use it, um, I mean, you're really in a system that probably very few countries in the world are, are able to um, to deal with. So that's the other side also there. It's it's not a, a very high priority in it at all. Um so um, I, I think at this stage, we, we cannot rely on, on pulse oximeters um, as we don't know how they work. It should be tested. Uh, at the other end, my experience with pulse oximeters is when they give a very low reading, um, it is because there's something wrong with the patient, not because there's something wrong with the equipment. So even if if you use them nowadays um, and it gives very low saturation rates, um, you would you, you should act as if it was low and not saying okay the pulse, pulse oximeter doesn't work. I think that's in case they are they are used. I think that's a very basic principle to keep in mind all the time. Nice. And lastly, um, can you talk for a minute on the value of mouth to mouth? Uh, ventilations. Um, what do you think about expired air um, for the resuscitation of the drowned patient? Yeah, that's 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 also one of the very essential and also very old 
um, questions uh, around the resuscitation of, of drowned victims. And I, I, I want to start at the other end, and that's at the, at the end, not of the, the person doing the resuscitation, but at the, at the side of the of the drowned victim, because many drowned victims are were, are taken out of the water, uh, look dead, but still they might have circulation. So, um, which also means that there is still oxygenation uh, in in the blood, and that what you are doing actually by resuscitation is just preventing the heart from stopping by giving some action some extra oxygen. So I, th I think this is something to, to realize very often. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, and as you will know, uh, we in the Netherlands, we had this very old organization, 250 years old still, uh, existing, and they promoted mouse-to-mouse -mouse ventilation already long time before we formal resuscitation starts. And there are hundreds, hundreds, really hundreds of cases where people survived only after mouse-to-mouse -mouse ventilation. So... And in many of these cases, probably the person wouldn't have ha would have looked dead, but wouldn't would not have had a really cardiac arrest situation. So this is something to keep in mind always um, as as a basic understanding of what you're doing during uh, mouse to mouse ventilation. Um, and then, of course, the added the additional amount of oxygen that you provide to the body is just not too much because in the expired air there's only 80 percent of oxygen while in the inspired air in the open air will be 21 so it's less but at the end at the level of the um of the cells where the oxygen is going to work that difference doesn't probably doesn't make too much a difference so i think um ventilation mouse to mouse ventilation even without extra oxygen is better than no ventilation and uh, in many circumstances, um, this will be a, a very a useful um, in, interaction with the patient that will uh, give him um, give you a, the um, give the um, good situation where the, the the drowning victim will start to respond, and you know that um, he is still still alive, which is I think very okay. Yeah, and I think catching them in those few minutes where they're in between a respiratory arrest and a cardiac arrest is really quite key. And they may have stopped breathing, but as you just said, they've maybe still got some circulation and you can essentially bring them back to life. Um, I think it's a much more difficult thing we're talking about if we reach the point where their heart has actually stopped. Um, that's typically very much further down the line. So I wanted to say that um, you've been an International Life Saving Federation for a long time, been a researcher and a clinician. Um, and, I want and, to make, a life. and a lifeguard. And a lifeguard. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. And, and I want to make um, people aware who might be uh, listening to us today or watching us. Uh, I want them to know that the International Life Saving Federation, if they go online, type in those words, and then the phrase medical position statement, there's a whole host of these statements, probably 20 of them, that talk about either tricky or controversial or difficult or very crucial aspects of the medical care of the drowned patient. And it could be quite useful for lifeguards to, um, to read those position statements because they've been developed by experts like yourself, people who've spent years studying these um, issues and, and doing research projects on them. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, hopefully this will reach some lifeguards and get spread out a bit on social media. Um, this is the first one we've done. I hope to do at least a few of them of the other medical position statements with other authors. And uh, I want to thank you for being the first one. And uh, thank you for making time this morning uh, from the Netherlands to uh, to talk with me. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it was really a pleasure doing this. I hope the lifeguards have something about it. And indeed, the uh, medical position statements contain a wealth of information from, and that's, I think, very important to realize. Everybody in this commission has been a lifeguard once in his life. So we know what we're talking about. We had a sand in our feet. We know how it's to swim in the ocean. So it's the same, the same way of thinking that the, the, the people have that are listening to this. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Joost. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.